Restoration is what we're talking about today. Restoration, it's really a big business in, in America. Um, there are a lot of people who like taking old things and having them made like new. It's a big industry. There are, there are television programs that are geared just toward restoration. I love HGTV and History Channel. Maybe you've seen the show American Restoration. It, it follows Rick Dale and his team around. Rick is from Rick's Restoration in Las Vegas. And Rick will ta- tackle any job. He will take the most worthless piece of junk you could find. It's not functional. It's not worth anything. And he will take it and he will like create it into this like beautiful thing that is in many cases better than new. I can't believe it's the same bike. I mean, Rick is a master of restoration. I mean, he takes stuff that's broken, stuff that doesn't work, stuff that has holes in it, and he, he makes it better than new. Mick, Rick is a master of, recon- of restoration. But today we are looking at the master of restoration. And he is one that doesn't just restore old motorcycles. He restores something far more precious. He restores lives. This summer, as Lisa mentioned, we've been in a series called The Untold Story of Jesus. Um, many wrote down the life and the account of the, the, the ministry and the death and resurrection of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, and Luke being some of them. And they all seem to tell the same story, the same storyline, the same timeline. They follow the same sources. But John was one of the closest of Jesus' friends and one of his closest disciples. And he knew about the other accounts of Jesus' life. He had probably read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he must have scratched his head and said, how could they have left out this story or that story? And so he sat down to write his gospel, telling uh, 90% of what is is in in his gospel is not included in the other three gospel accounts. And so really, John wrote his account in order to tell the untold story of Jesus. And today we look at yet another story a story told by John that no one else records, and the story really is a story about restoration. And if you'd like to follow along, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, we're going to be in John chapter 5 today. And let me encourage you to find that in the story of the healing of the, at the pool. Now, usually I would read the Bible account and we would follow along, but there's a movie that was made called The Gospel of John, which is a word-by-word following of The Gospel of John. Every word in the script is taken from Scripture, and they did a really good telling of this particular story, and I'd love to show it to you this morning. So John begins his account of the story by saying that Jesus was in Jerusalem for a festival, and he, he chooses to go somewhere that most healthy people would not choose to go. Again, he goes to the pool of Bethesda, where many, many sick people, invalids, would, would uh, sit by the pool. And again, Jesus is showing, just like he did last week in John chapter 4, that he's willing to cross any barrier in order to bring the gospel of his kingdom to whoever, whoever needed it. Last week we saw that he crossed sin barriers and racial barriers and gender barriers. But now he is crossing even health barriers, going to those people who most needed to be restored. And uh, why were all these people at the pool? Well, we're told that the, many of the people believe that there were mystical powers in this particular pool, that an angel would come down, it said, and stir the water, and the first person into the water would be healed. And we don't know if anyone was ever healed like this, but we know that Jesus is going to offer healing in a very different way. And John tells us that somehow, some way, Jesus had learned that this man had been sick, an invalid, paralyzed for 38 years. We don't know if someone was giving him a tour of the area and said, oh, that guy, he's the the most helpless of them all. He's been here for 38 years. We don't know if Jesus had a dialogue with him. We don't know if Jesus just knew this because he was the son of God. We don't know. But he knows that this man, stand and he comes before him, has been in this position for 38 years. And he's standing behind a person who would have been considered the most hopeless of all cases. And he asks the man a question that seems really, really curious at first, doesn't it? I mean, he says to the man, do you want to get well? And and again, it just seems like that is a a question that doesn't need to be asked. I mean, it seems like it would have an obvious answer. Of course I want to be made well. Why do you think I've been sitting here by this pool for the last 38 years? I am a paraplegic. I want to be made well. I mean, to be sure, to be a paraplegic in the first century was no easy task. Uh, It's never been easy to be a paraplegic. um, But in the first century, just think about what it would have been like. There were no wheelchairs. And so... To get from point A to point B, you had to either depend on someone to pick you up and physically carry you, or more likely, you were dragging yourself around by your hands, pulling your legs behind you, scraping up your legs, having calloused, ulcerated hands as you're pulling yourself around. And we all know that someone in this man's position would have no uh, control over their bowels or their bladder. And you know what that means. That would mean filth and stink. 
and absolutely no hygiene. And so this man stunk. And so people would have avoided him. More than that, he would have to depend on the goodness and the generosity of others because he couldn't work. And so there would certainly days, be days when he didn't eat because maybe the, the generous people didn't come by the pool that particular day. He lived an incredibly difficult life at the very bottom of society. So why wouldn't he want to be made well? Why does Jesus ask the question? Well, there's lots of reasons why he may not want to be made well. And they're the same reasons many of us don't want to be made well. Maybe for this man, maybe he had grown to uh, embrace his identity as an invalid. Maybe he enjoyed being pitied and living off the gener generosity of others. Maybe this man, like many of us, had told his sad story so many times that it had become a part of his identity that just gave him comfort. I am the crippled guy who depends on the help of other people. I don't know who I would be if I was no longer that guy. Right? Now, I'm not saying that's what the, the man was thinking. I'm not saying that's what you think. I'm saying some people think that way. Therefore, the question of Jesus, do you want to be made well, is a valid question. Do you want to be made well? And this is a question that Jesus asks of every one of us. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be restored? Do you want to live life as I originally intended it to be lived? Jesus offers every one of us the gospel of the kingdom of God. He offers his presence and his power in every area of our lives. He offers to meet us in our sin. He offers to meet us in our brokenness and in our pain and begin a work to restore us, to make us whole. He offers to invade our bodies with his presence, with his power, with his kingdom, and to begin to restore our broken sexuality and to restore our broken self-identity and to restore our broken image of him. He comes into us and he says, I want to restore your broken relationships with the people around you. Yes, I even ultimately want to restore your broken body, making it imperishable and incorruptible. I mean, he offers us the life and the power of God in every broken area of our lives. I mean, and we, we would say, what good news? I mean, who would possibly say no to this? Who wouldn't want to be made well? But look around. People are saying no to Jesus' offer all the time. And, and I think one of the reasons that we say no to this offer is because we have so shrunk down the good news and we have so underestimated the power of the gospel that we don't really even see it as good news at all. We see it as okay news. Because many of us have heard the gospel of the kingdom of God and we think of it as sin management. That Jesus came and became one of us to die for our sins so that he could make us better moral people. That he could help us stop sinning so much and do good things and not bad things. And that doesn't sound like that good of news to, to many of us. Or many of us look at the good news as fire management. That Jesus came and died for our sins so that we don't have to go to the hot place when we die. We can go to the good place when we die. And again, that is really good news, but I can kind of put that off. I don't really need that in my life today. And so many of us say no to Jesus' offer. Do you want to be made well? Because we underestimate the power of the gospel. We have so shrunk it down that it's not that great of news. But is that the extent of what Jesus offers us and is offering this man? And the answer is no. It is so much bigger and so much better than sin management or fire insurance. The gospel of the kingdom of God is such good news because it is about, again, the life and the power and the presence of God entering into all of me right now, being fully available to every person today, and that his life and his power will invade us and, and begin to take the broken pieces of our lives and restore them and make us whole. The good news is that God wants to do a, a work in all of us to restore us and to, and to heal us and, and to make every, us a much better version of us than we have ever experienced before. And this really is Good news. I mean, if we really understand the good news as it, is, as it is in Christ, the only person who would say no to it is the person who says, you know what, no, I want to stay in my sin. I think I like sin more than what you're offering me. Or it would be the person who says, I want to remain in control of my life because I'm not really sure I trust you enough yet to give you control of my life. I'm not sure you could do a better job. So let me just say, wherever you are with Jesus and wherever you are in your spiritual journey, know this. Jesus stands before every one of us today and every day. 
And he asks this question, not just of an invalid by a pool, but of every person who has ever lived, do you want to be made well? He asks the man by the, the pool of Bethesda, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be restored? And the man doesn't answer. The man doesn't answer, but rather he kind of gives excuses as to why he can't be made whole. Right? He says to him, well, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. So Jesus says, do you want to be made well? And, and he explains why he can't be made well. He, he has become myopic. All he could see, the only way out is this pool that has no power whatsoever to heal him. Here before him stands the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Here before him stands the creator of the universe, the one who had made his legs and made the pool and made the angels who supposedly come down and stir the water. And, and, and the man is missing it. God is standing before him, offering to make him whole. And, and he's looking to a pool that has no power. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't blame this man for not recognizing who Jesus was. How was he to know who was standing before him? How could he know it? But it just seems to be so ironic that there before him, there before the man, was someone who could definitely make him well. Asking if he wanted to be made well. And all the man could do is list all the reasons why he couldn't be made well. And do I even need to apply this? I mean, how, how often do we do this in our own lives? Jesus comes to us do you want to be made well? Let me help you forgive that person because I could see that that unforgiveness is eating you up inside. It's making you bitter and an angry person. You're not very much fun to be around while, while you're holding on to this unforgiveness. And we say, but Lord, don't you know what they did to me? If only I told you the story of what they did to me, you would understand why I can never forgive them. Or don't you want to be free from that addiction? He comes to us, do you want to be made well, free from that sin addiction, the, the alcohol addiction, the drug addiction, the sex addiction, the porn addiction? Don't you want to be free of that? And we give him excuses as to why. I, I've tried so many times before, Lord, but it has such a power over me. I, I can never be free of that. Or he comes to us and he says, don't you want to live abundant life? I mean, life as it was intended to be lived, free of regret, free of, of resentment, free of fear, free of anger. Don't you want to live a life of love? Lord, don't you know what's happened to me? Have you, let me tell you my life story. Let me tell you what I've been through. Let me tell you what I've done. Let me tell you why I can never live an abundant, vibrant life. I mean, do we know who is making the offer? But Jesus is undeterred. He doesn't just make the offer once. He persists. No matter with this guy, he, he, he goes one further. He doesn't just persist, but he just says, get up. I know you didn't answer my question, but get up. Pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. The crippled man, the one who had been paralyzed for 38 years, the most hopeless case at the pool was restored. And here's the really amazing part that blows my mind in this story. It's not the fact that the guy was healed, that the most helpless, hopeless case was healed because Jesus was a specialist at healing. He's always working mirrors, he, restoring people, healing people. He does that all the time. But here's what gets me in this story is that Jesus heals him before the man even asked him to, before the man answered the question, or before he even demonstrated any kind of faith in who Jesus was. The man, as we later learn, doesn't even know Jesus' name, doesn't know who is standing before him. This is pretty remarkable. I mean, this is, this is a rare story in the Gospels. I think this is why John records it. Most stories of healing that we read in the Gospels are a result of faith, right? That and Jesus would continually say, your faith has healed you, or you are healed according to your faith. It seems that oftentimes the work of God in our lives is a result of the faith that we have in Jesus. But this is an expression of God's grace that is very different, an expression of his healing that's very different. Here is the man who expresses no faith, makes no request, doesn't know who Jesus is, but Jesus heals him. Wow. Does that just like blow the lid off of the little box that you put God in or faith in? This is what theologians call common grace. All through the Bible, we read of how God expresses his goodness to everyone. 
The giver of life gives life to everyone who lives, regardless of who that person will become, whether a Hitler or a Mother Teresa, or regardless of whether they will ever acknowledge him or not. He gives life to all. More than that, he gives goodness to all. He sends rain and gives food and provides shelter and provides happiness and joy to all. Regardless of who we are, regardless of where we've been, regardless of whether, whether we'll ever acknowledge him, it is common grace. It is the goodness of God expressed to everyone and anyone. And here we see Jesus extending grace and life and restoration to a man before he has faith simply as an expression of his goodness. And, and what he's doing is he is demonstrating the fact that the kingdom of God has come and it is available to all, even the most helpless of cases. It's available to everyone. And it's still true today. I mean, the goodness and the grace of God is still available to everyone, regardless of our story, regardless of what we've done, regardless of what we haven't done, regardless of what we will do, regardless of what we won't do. God extends his offer of the gospel of the kingdom of God to all of us. And he still blesses all and gives life to all and provides for all. Well, this newly restored man, he walks away. Walks away. And then John offers a bit more information about the story. And and here he tells a a bit of a a story within the story. And and I wouldn't be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor if I didn't spend a, a moment or two unpacking these important details because John points out that the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And as the man carries his mat away from being healed after being a paralytic for 38 years, the Jews, presumably the Jewish leaders, criticized the man for carrying his mat on the Sabbath, which was forbidden. Not by God. God had had given humanity this amazing gift called the Sabbath, the week of creation. He said, this is going to be a gift for you to give you life, to give you a relationship with one another, give you a relationship with me. Yes, there are boundaries that you should have around this day, things that you shouldn't do so that you can fit in things that you should do. Therefore, I want you to not work, and I want you to stop consuming. There's two things that most define your identity, work and consumption. I want you to stop those things, but everything else, I want you to do whatever gives you life, right? But what had happened is the Jews had taken, taken those few boundaries that, that God had given and they had exponentially multiplied them into the point where the day was a burden. They, they, they extrapolated these rules to the point where they were more concerned that a man was carrying his mat on the Sabbath than a man had just been healed after 38 years of paralysis. And so how does religion get to that point? The Jews had a book called the Mishnah. We still have copies of the Mishnah. It's not the Bible, but it was, uh, they took all the oral sayings of the rabbis and the teachers and they wrote them down. These are extra laws and rules that the Jews would then follow. And they had over 600 laws on the Sabbath. Let's just kind of consider some of these together. John Brunt writes that according to the Mishnah, putting out a fire was illegal on the Sabbath as was carrying something from one's house. However, certain exceptions were made if one's house was on fire. So if your house is burning down, you could carry food out of your house, but only enough for every member of your family to get them through the Sabbath. Okay, now you could also go into your house and you, could ca- you couldn't carry clothing out of the house, but you could wear clothing out of the house. Now, d- rabbis differed as to whether you can go back into your house and into the burning building to put on a second set of clothes to save those clothes. Putting the fire out was not allowed, but if a Gentile volunteered, then a good Jew could allow the Gentile to put out the fire. However, the Jew could not ask the Gentile to put the fire out. It seems complicated, doesn't it? But it's not supposed to be. And it also doesn't seem like very much fun, and it wasn't. The Sabbath, the gift from God, had been turned into a day of, of burden and, and, and rule-keeping and judgment and criticism. And, 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 and I know that within Adventism, it seems as though we have had our version of the Mishnah, Um, I'm told that in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s that rules for Sabbath keeping were very clear and pretty much universal no matter where you would go. For instance, running and playing were acceptable, but no balls of any kind were to be used. And all playground equipment was definitely off. Hikes were all right, but swimming was wrong, although wading up to your knees was generally acceptable. (laughs) Again, it sounds complicated, and I don't at all want to come across as saying that there should be no boundaries around Sabbath keeping. Because I think there should be. 
I think we should all think through what is the Sabbath intended to do? How could I set boundaries around this gift from God so that I can honor it and keep it holy and get from it what I, I'm intended to get from it? I have boundaries. Our family has boundaries. I hope you have boundaries in, in your Sabbath keeping. The idea is not to throw the gift out, but to strip away the things that keep it from being the life-giving gift it was intended to be. Man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. So the idea is to get at the heart of what the gift is intended to give. And that is a time to stop our work, to stop our consuming, to stop our frantic activity so that we could focus on what matters most. And that's what Jesus was doing at the pool of Bethesda. He was doing more than just restoring a man. Jesus is restoring a gift from God. There is a reason he told this man to take up your mat and walk. He wanted to stir things up. He wanted to start a conversation. He was doing more than just restoring a man. He wants to restore the law. He's seeking to give the, the Sabbath back, turn it back into a day that it was supposed to be, a day stripped of burdensome rules and focused on acts of charity and kindness and service and mercy. And the Jews would look at Jesus and they would say, well, there is a lawbreaker. But Jesus was no lawbreaker. Jesus was a law restorer. He's showing us what it looks like. Well, John tells us that they see each other again in the temple. And, and Jesus has something to say to him. He says to him, see you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. I don't know if that makes you as uncomfortable as it makes me. I, I, just, I mean, can we just say that? That's an uncomfortable thing. I'm like, why did he have to go there? I mean, what is he saying? Um, for one, it seems just a bit harsh, you know, stop sinning. And, and number two, it seems like he's equating the man's condition with a sin. And, and we're not comfortable with that. Definitely not comfortable with that. But let's just unpack what Jesus is saying. I mean, sometimes bad things happen to us for no fault of our own right? There's no explanation. Bad things happen all the time, and it's no fault of their own. People who take really good care of themselves get sick. Um, good drivers get into accidents because bad drivers aren't paying attention. Um, people are born with handicaps. It's no fault of their own. I mean, sometimes bad things happen at no fault of our own, but other times it is our fault, if we're honest, right? Sometimes sin leads to pain and difficulties in our lives. Sometimes we get sick because we live really just unhealthy, out-of-control lives. Sometimes we get cancer because we smoke. Sometimes we have accidents because we're the bad driver. Sometimes we suffer injury because of, of foolishness or because of sin. I mean, we don't know what this particular man did, but Jesus seemed to have known, and so he tells him, Stop sinning, or something worse will happen to you. Stop sinning. Wow, two words that seem so simple, right? Wouldn't that be great if I just say, you know, the sermon could be really short. Stop sinning. We're like, okay, well, that makes sense. Why didn't I try that before? You know, it's not that easy. Sin has a power over us. Sin is very attractive. But here's what I want us to get, is that Jesus is the one saying this, and the same power that he just demonstrated over this man's body to heal him is available in that man's soul to give him power and the desire to stop sinning. Jesus is not going to ask us to do something without giving us the power to do it, without giving us the desire to do it. And so just as he could say, take up your mat, get up and walk after 38 years of not walking, he could say to the man, stop sinning. Let me in. Let my kingdom into your life and you, I will change your desires from the inside out and I will give you power to stop sinning. You're not in this on your own. So Jesus gives us the command, but he also gives us the power. And I just want to point out here, last point, and when Jesus said this, I mean, just, just think about the order of things and how this whole story goes, the order of things, because a lot of us think that he got the order wrong. He heals the man, blesses the man, gives the man grace, lets him go away, then happens to run into him later, and then deals with the man's sin. Isn't that backwards? I mean, shouldn't he deal with the man's sin first and then bless him? Isn't that the way a lot of us think God works? And God works like, well, once you get your act together, then I can bless you. Or once you get your life straightened up, then I can heal you. 
But Jesus flips it upside down. He turns it around. And I think there's so much for us to learn in the way God deals with us and in the way we need to deal with one another. It says grace first. It's blessing first. He gives the man an opportunity to taste the kingdom of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So the man was like, wow, you've got my attention. And then once credibility was built, once Jesus had relationship with the man, then Jesus is able to tell him, stop sinning. And again, this is the same, same way that God approaches us. He blesses us way, well before we clean up our lives. And that's the way we're supposed to treat one another. That those of us who are members of God's kingdom, who would say Jesus is the leader of our lives, we are passionate Christ followers, Jesus sends us out, salt and light in the world. He wants us to invite others to taste and see that God is good. But it doesn't start with dealing with somebody's sin. It doesn't start by pointing out where they're out of alignment with God. It starts by extending grace, extending acceptance, inviting them into community so that they can taste and see how good God really is. And then once someone is in community and they're beginning to start to say, wow, I want to follow Jesus. Then the Holy Spirit starts to deal with somebody and starts to point out their sin. And it is a process. It's a process for all of us. I'm in process. You're in process. We are being restored. And we need to give God patience with other people as well. I'm so glad that this is a community that lets the Holy Spirit deal with people as he sees fit. So what's the application here? What do we do with this? Well, a couple things. I figured that we, could pro we probably all fit in maybe one or two camps. There's probably some of us who are more like those religious leaders who missed the activity of God because it didn't fit in their box, right? We would say, you know what? This is the way God works. I know this is the way God works. God doesn't deviate from this. I have all the answers. I'm very clear. And so as you're doing that, God is working all around you and you're missing it. Because you need God to blow the lid and the walls off of the little box you've put God and his grace in because it is so much bigger than what you've imagined. We see that in the story at the healing by a pool. Jesus is wanting to restore us, religious people, to be able to just trust what he's doing in the lives of other people so that we could join him in it, so we could see it and join him in it. And maybe we just need to kind of uh, ask God to magnify himself in our minds, to magnify grace in our our lives. But really for all of us, Jesus is saying to all of us, do you want to be made well? Stop sinning. And this is what he said to me uh, 23 years ago, 24 years ago, 23 years he, uh, old, he comes to me and says, do you want to be made well? And I said, maybe. And I was invited into a community much like New Day where people loved me just were right where I was and they extended God's kingdom to me, his grace to me, and love. And I walked with God for a while and I, I got to taste to see what he was like. And after several months of, of experiencing that, I, he again said to me, now, do you want to be made well? And I had realized that the life I was living was not the life I wanted to live anymore and I wanted to live this new life. And I said, yes. And in that moment, I received salvation. My eternity was sealed. But that's where God began a work of restoration in my life that he's still doing today. Because every day he comes to me again and says, do you want to be made well in this area of your life? Then stop sinning in this area. And I'm wondering if you've made that decision. Because we all need to make it. Because he stands before us and he offers us good news that is beyond comprehension. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be restored?